65 years, uh, since 65 years today, the age of retirement for many people, that Hiroshima was bombed. And just three days later, of course, we know that Nagasaki was leveled. During that time, the atomic bomb has not been retired. In fact, we're still making them. Uh, plans are still for a first use by the United States. And Professor Bix, maybe later, will be talking about constitute the uh, Japanese Constitution in Article 9. That's all I have to say because we have really a jam-packed uh, uh, setup this morning. Uh, Mayor Ryan is here, and uh, uh, we're going to be asking him shortly to, uh, to come up uh, because he has an appointment later. So if we could, uh, if we could ask Helena first, Helena Garrett, uh, to come up. You remember that Helena last year was here to tell us about her pilgrimage, uh, mostly on uh, uh, Shikuku, wasn't it, uh, that uh, you were? Uh, the island of Shikuku, Japan, and meeting people, meeting Japanese people as she did the Shinto pilgrimage. Uh, she wants to tell you what followed with that and then introduce a few folks. Helena? Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, last year I walked a Buddhist pilgrimage. It's called the 88 Temple Pilgrimage. And it's very popular and very important in Japan. And there, the last 10 days, somebody took pity on me because I got lost all the time having to read the Japanese signs. And so I met Mr. Takashi Usui. And uh, Jack suggested, why don't you invite these people? And I discovered through emails later on that they are very much involved in Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, which uh, states that there won't be any armed forces in Japan to uh, solve disputes. So um, they are the right people to be here. So. Um, before you get to meet them, though, I uh, would like the mayor to come up. Mayor, please. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, uh, every year I come to this breakfast, and it's great to see so many uh, people who believe in peace and believe in uh, disarmament. And, uh, you know, it's... I'm a real history buff, and I've been listening lately to different uh, tapes of the not so long ago, you know, when Nixon was president, and he was seriously considering why don't we use nuclear weapons in Vietnam? Um, and it's it's a, it's a something that we have to continue to be very vigilant about, to continue the fight to eradicate um, nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. And I really applaud all the people here who uh, spend so much time. As that as one of their goals. I also uh, am very thankful that uh, the Broome County Peace Action and all the veterans and everybody who uh, gave me the opportunity, gave the city the opportunity to be involved in what I think was a uh, an internationally recognized event and got the controversy going about our current uh, uh, conflicts <laughs> wars uh, that we're fighting by able being able to put up the cost of war sign which uh, was a great success and now has been handed off to our uh, brothers and sisters in, in Syracuse to do uh, at the state fair and eventually it will find its way back here. But uh, thanks for all the work you do all year long. Today I'm here to uh, give a proclamation on Hiroshima, Hiroshima Day Remembrance, August 6, 2010. And it reads, whereas on August 6, 1945, the world was forever changed as U.S. bomber Enola Gay dropped an atomic bomb nicknamed Little Boy on Hiroshima, Japan, a city with very little military value. This was the first time that any nation used nuclear weapons against another. And whereas the initial explosion devastated five square miles and destroyed more than 60% of the buildings in the city, early Japanese counts put the casualties at 118,661, but later, um, Understandings of radiation sickness and related deaths led to international estimates that 140,000 of Hiroshima's 350,000 population were killed. This does not count injuries and later cancers that cut short life expectancies. And whereas 65 years later we still stand in remembrance 
of all the innocent lives lost in Hiroshima, Japan. And now, therefore, I, Matthew T. Ryan, Mayor of the City of Binghamton, to hereby proclaim August 6, 2010, to be Hiroshima Remembrance Day in the City of Binghamton. And I encourage all our citizens to join me in reflecting on the atrocious events that occurred in August 1945 in Hiroshima, Japan. Thank you. If we can please have our four Japanese guests uh, come up. Asako is our translator. She speaks fluently English, so we're very fortunate. And this is her mom, Tomoko. And then comes Mr. Uh, Takashi, whom I met in Japan. And then Mr. Ii. These are our guests all the way from Japan. Thank you. Okay, Thank ahead. you for coming. And, uh, yeah. We do have, uh, for each of you, a uh, key to our city. We're very proud that you came here to remember this day with us. Okay, you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is a key to our city. To our thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Here today um, is a thousand piece of a crane origami, a message for peace from a high school student. We have a custom in Japan that we make a thousand small origami shaped a, a crane uh, as a sign for peace. These students also visited uh, Okinawa and brought thousand pieces of, of a crane for showing their respect for the death of Okinawa students during World War II. Now they uh, gave us these uh, cranes with their hope to ban nuclear weapons. We hope that you will never give up and always move forward with your peace movement, even if you encounter some unwelcome reactions on the way. Thank you so much, and thank you. We'll put this at City Hall so everybody can see it. Uh, yeah, that's who comes to visit. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, they are also very involved in a book that's called Barefoot Gen, and um, it's a series of ten manga books. And they are lying in the back there, and there is a copy at our public library here locally that you can borrow it. And there's also a DVD, and if anybody is interested in watching this DVD, just uh, write your name on the list and then you can uh, borrow it from me. It's uh, about a little boy in Hiroshima that went through the atomic bomb and what happened to his family and so on. So it's a very worthwhile uh, project and they just finished translating the 10th volume of this book, Barefoot Gem. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. And if we can, if we can have, so we can have the folks have been practicing uh, English. Ahsoka obviously is fluent in English. Uh, the other uh, three friends uh, uh, are learning, and so they, nevertheless they really would like to uh, speak to you in Japanese. If there's any problem with uh, uh, with understanding, then later down at Peace Park, it can be clarified, and there would be time then for Ahsoka to uh, uh, clarify whatever has to be clarified. Okay? So, who's going to go first? The sheep. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I first 
could like to uh, apologize, apologize my English is no good. <laughs> uh, next, thank you so much for uh, having us today. Uh, my name is Takashi Usui. Uh, three of us uh, high school friends uh, uh, from back in the day. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. uh, now we are 66 or uh, 67 years young. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, August 5th, we left Tokyo and arrived at Binghamton in last evening. Uh, let me uh, briefly explain what brought us uh, here to join, uh, join you today uh, for this ceremony. Last summer, Helena Gera asked me about uh, the Japanese opinion uh, re regarding uh, nuclear weapons uh, for her speak on Hiroshima Day. I was very honored to help her and gathered many thoughts and opinions from colleges, high school students, and friends. Uh, I bring here in uh, attendance uh, this year. Thank you. <laughs> I am one of Takashi's high school friends that gave a report on nuclear weapons. My hope is uh, for more people to know about the consequences of atomic bomb. With the donations from 43 friends, we were able to um, send to you comic books called Better Again. A book of photographs and children's books and DVDs. The Barefoot Game at the book is a 30 years best seller in Japan. And it revolves around life after the bomb. I am happy to say that volunteers recently. Uh, finished translating the last uh, volume, ten, volume to English, and it, would, it was sent to President Obama's daughter as a gift. Hi. My name is Naonobu E. I was uh, helping Takashi by uh, writing my poem about nuclear weapon and also help co uh, coordinating <laughs> coordinating uh, to send Barefoot to K, uh, to Helena. My hope is people will understand the tragedy of nuclear weapon. Later, at the peace park, I will sing a poem about a girl who died from atomic bombing atomic bombing. The poem singing is a Japanese traditional performance. Uh, Jim Clone, president of uh, Peace Council, would like to make a presentation. Jim. <laughs> Hello. 
Hi, I'm the president of Peace Action. My button, if you can't read it, it says truth yeah. is the first casualty of war. Most of the rest of the civilian are civilians. That, that's one thing we need to remember, especially on a day like today. Peace Action was founded, the local chapter of Peace Action was founded 29 years ago to say no to nuclear weapons. And I want to say something that you haven't, have never heard from our national government yet. We want to apologize. We want to apologize for the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I'm up here to give them a gift from Broome County Peace Action. We have some t-shirts that were made up for today. In fact, one, of, one side of it says Hiroshima Nagasaki Remembrance, and the other side is about Peace Action, Binghamton, New York, August 6, 2010. And these are on sale for everybody here for $10 each. We encourage everybody to get them. They're a fundraiser, but we want to give uh, one to each of our guests. I got too small and too uh, medium, too large. Okay. But obviously, you can pick out the sizes you want better, better than I can. It, uh, it really is quite a privilege to have uh, Professor Herbert Picks here. Uh, Herb, as you know, is a board member of Peace Action in Binghamton. And when uh, Takashi, uh, the history teacher, uh, learned that Herb was going to uh, be here, he said, what a wonderful coincidence, because he read Herb's Pulitzer Prize winning book, Hirohito, in the Making of Modern Japan. And Herb is well known as a scholar, not just in the United States, uh, of course, he taught at Harvard, and now we have the pleasure of having him at uh, Binghamton University. But he's been very important in establishing the program in Japanese studies at uh, uh, Binghamton University, and very, very prominent in the Asian society in the United States. So uh, it's a great pleasure, then, to have uh, uh, Herb Bix speak to us this morning, uh, legacy uh, of uh, World War II, uh, Japan to the United States. So uh, Herb, thanks again. My title says it all, The Political Legacy to the United States. I start from the premise that the time has come to talk, to link Hiroshima Day Remembrance with what historian Gary Wills called the quiet revolution in governance that was set in motion by America's development and use <clears throat> of atomic bombs against the citizens of two Japanese cities. As Wills pointed out in Bomb Power, the modern presidency and the national security state, atomic destruction in Japan and the growth of secret non-accountable government, government in America are inseparably linked. So today we need to reflect not only on the damages that the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki suffered from the heat rays, the radiation, and the blasts that killed an estimated 140,000 people in Hiroshima and another 70,000 in Nagasaki by the end of December 1945. We must also, more than ever, Focus today on how atomic bomb possession transformed America's global role, impacted its political class, and reshaped the nature of presidential power. And that's what I want to talk about. The atomic bombs that destroyed Japanese cities were the climax of a year of intense civilian bombing in Germany and especially Japan. The bombing hastened the conversion of the United States from a constitutional republic 
in which sovereignty supposedly inhered in the people into a national security state in which it inhered in the president. Thereafter, overwhelming power steadily accrued to the executive branch while the Congress became its appendage. And this paved the way for the illegal, secretive, aggressive use of force and violation of constitutional norms that reached their height in the administration of George W. Bush and that continue unchecked today. This transformation occurred almost unnoticed over a 69 or 70 year period starting around 1940-41. That's when President Franklin D. Roosevelt declared a state of national war emergency after having secretly brought the U.S. into an undeclared war against Nazi Germany with his destroyer deal in exchange for the right to lease American bases from Great Britain. Then came Pearl Harbor, a surprise attack welcomed, rejoiced at by many politicians at the time. They never said it publicly, but they rejoiced at the fact that this would unify the nation's deep class divisions behind a new war. And next, Roosevelt secretly authorized the Manhattan Project for the construction of atomic bombs. He kept funding for the multi-billion dollar wartime project that was spread out across the country in industrial sites and in universities. He kept it completely hidden from congressional and public scrutiny. It was the first of many constitutionally illegal acts that occurred in the construction of the national security state. It was during the last years of the Second World War that the government laid the foundations for a new American empire whose power rested on forward deployed airplanes, warships, and bases that could deliver conventional and atomic bombs. The bases were secured by unequal military alliances and status of forces agreements, NATO and AMPO, or where treaties didn't suffice and governments refused to take U.S. orders by coups d'etat and the establishment of client regimes. Concurrently, Presidents Truman and Eisenhower accelerated a nuclear arms race. First, by Truman's decision to build up the military and produce and stockpile more and more nuclear weapons. Then from 1949, when Russia broke the American monopoly on the bomb, by his decision to build the hydrogen bomb and increase nuclear arms production and atmospheric testing. Both of these early Cold War presidents expanded and consolidated the empire of bases and brought into existence a fully articulated national security state. Will's useful timeline shows the initial steps that gradually transformed the post-World War II governmental system and ended up lodging power in vast, secretive, unaccountable, but interlocking federal bureaucracies. Creation of a substructure of hidden power started with the, president, the imperial president's assertion 
of a unique right to wage atomic, biological, and chemical warfare and to instill fear in the public through various institutions of the executive branch. To particularize, the Atomic Energy Act, 1946, established under the President the Atomic Energy Commission, quote, a civilian body to control all domestic uses of atomic energy. It gave the President this, unquote, quote, sole authority, unquote, over the bomb's use. And here's the point. This meant that in the exercise of this power alone, he was placed outside the constitutional order, unaccountable to anybody else. The National Security Act, 1947, established both the President's National Security Council and the CIA, which quickly began acting outside the law. Loyalty oaths and the Attorney General's list of subversive organizations fleshed out the early institutions of the national security state. These were augmented between 1947, you know, that's the year of the start of, formal start of the Cold War, the Truman Doctrine. The Cold War, the start of really of the Cold War anti-communist ideological crusade, and the inauguration of the National Security Agency in 1952. Think 1947 to 1952. In this period, Truman established the U.S. Air Force as a separate service charged with delivering the bombs. On his own authority, Truman committed the nation to waging the Korean War, never asking Congress for a declaration of war, because this freed him to use or threaten other countries with any weapon he chose. Abroad, the U.S. began assassinations and psychological warfare operations and the overthrow of governments. At home, national mobilization in so-called peacetime got underway in accordance with various National Security Council policy documents whose contents were also kept secret from Congress and the public. The CIA, whose head, the Director of Central Intelligence, reported to the President The CIA waged psychological warfare and engaged in massive foreign and domestic spying. Its agents in the Office of Special Operations committed murder, assassination, and torture. Their covert activity toppled the governments of Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran, Jacobo Abenz in Guatemala, and Salvador Allende in Chile to name just a few of the more notorious cases. The president had authority over the CIA, as well as the intelligence estimates that CIA officers produced. But you know, their estimates could always be politicized and cherry-picked to give him and his policymakers what they wanted, if they wanted it badly enough. Well, today, we know for a fact that George W. Bush and Richard Cheney pressured the CIA and got from it in 2003 a WMD justification for launching the current unprovoked illegal war in Iraq. During the Vietnam War, whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg released the classified Pentagon Papers to the New York Times. His disclosure of state secrets frightened President Nixon. For Ellsberg pulled the veil from the hidden government 
operating on a clandestine level with presidents lying to the public to justify aggressive war and cover up their crimes. Until that time, most Americans did not know what the various instruments of the US government were doing in Southeast Asia, let alone how incompetent where Vietnam was concerned were Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon and their national policy advisors. After the Vietnam War, the national security state underwent reorganization. Tension between the hidden or real US government and Congress became visible in Senate and House investigations of the CIA. This followed Watergate. In 1979, Senator Frank Church's committee investigated CIA crimes and tried to retrieve lost congressional prerogatives in foreign policy by checking the president's powers to wage war. New York Representative Otis Pike, chairing the House Intelligence Committee, did likewise. Pike's committee issued a final report concluding, among other things, that the total U.S. intelligence budget had been hidden from Congress, and that because of secrecy, and I quote from his final conclusion, Taxpayers and most of Congress did not know and cannot find out how much they, meaning the CIA, spend on spy activities, unquote. Under the Constitution, Article 1, Section 9, 7, such secret funding is plainly illegal. But the rot, I like that word. <laughs> I could say the degradation. The degradation produced by the American system of authoritarian decision-making, non-accountability for high officials, and weak or non-existent so-called congressional oversight of the executive branch was far too advanced to be checked by any Senate or House committee, let alone the War Powers Act. Oh. President Ford, Henry Kissinger, and the CIA undermined the Church and Pike committees. Ford and his successors, with the exception of Jimmy Carter, ignored the War Powers Reservation, Resolution of 1973. They all ignored it. Well, Jimmy Carter. I like Jimmy Carter. <laughs> During the presidency of Ronald Reagan, there were other scandals, such as Iran-Contra in 1986-87, which showed the extent to which secrecy had become a device for deceiving Congress. But it needs to be remembered that executive branch obsession with secrecy originally grew from the Manhattan Project, the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the need thereafter to care for, to nurture atomic weapons and their means of delivery. At the start of the 1990s, the Soviet Union collapsed. And the national security state resumed its expansion, eventually acquiring bases in Eastern Europe and near the southern and Central Asian borders of the Russian Federation. Meanwhile, the US military budget kept on growing, growing to the dismay of many peace movement activists who had expected a peace dividend Remember the peace dividend? Because they had mistakenly, naively thought 
you were, well, I, I was naive too. Uh, they thought US militarism was a function only of the Cold War, which it never was. Corporations doing business with the Pentagon, the Daddy Warbucks, and the politicians owning Daddy Warbucks stock are taking both corporate dividends and campaign contributions always played an important role. U.S. behavior in the 90s, particularly during the G.W. Bush and W.J. Clinton presidencies, showed the recurrence of a U.S. tendency to ignore international law regarding the direct and indirect aerial targeting of civilians and their dual-use infrastructure. And this was evidenced in the U.S. and British air assault on Iraq. Remember the free fly zones over Iraq? And it was evidenced in their humanitarian bombing of Kosovo and Serbia in 1999 with so-called precision guided weapons. And then during the, 21st, the first decade of the 21st century, the 9-11 terrorist attacks gave President Bush and his team their golden opportunity to declare a war on terror, expand the national security state, and set aside international and domestic law constraints on the conduct of war. Thereafter, reflecting the fusion of governmental and corporate power that had been ongoing for decades. U.S. wars and intelligence gathering were increasingly contracted out to private corporations. Official secrecy also increased and became in constitutional scholar Glenn Greenwald's apt, <clears throat> apt words, quote, the religion of the political class and the prime enabler of its corruption, unquote, as seen in the Pentagon's loss of, loss, loss of billions of dollars earmarked for the reconstruction in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm nearing the end of my time. Have I gone over my time? No, just about. Or then I shouldn't finish. No, go ahead and finish. Finish. Okay. Well, I said that because I was going to finish anyway. <laughs> Thus, not only was a point reached where the momentum of the power shift from legislature to executive branch became irreversible, but more important, the Patriot Act and other legislation enacted after 9-11 allowed the Bush and Obama Justice Departments to brutally suppress civil liberties, trample on the Constitution, and punish whistleblowers. The presidency of Barack Obama, who subsequently normalized as drone assassination as a tactic of U.S. foreign policy has merely, has merely confirmed these facts. And so to resume, to sum it all up, as developed after 1945, atomic bomb power brought the U.S., an historically militaristic nation, much closer to modern imperial Japan in the period when Japanese officials fought their long war on the Asian continent. B, control over nuclear weapons concentrated power in the office of the president, strengthened his mystique as commander in chief, and allowed President G.W. Bush to arrogantly assert a unilateral right to disregard the moral norms that underlie the laws of war and to use the office of legal counsel in the Justice Department 
to give himself legal permission to do whatever he wanted to do. And last, atomic bomb power wedded the US military to the veneration and massive use of force to shock and awe and to collateral damage or the killing of civilians in situations where American forces could never distinguish friend from foe. Think of the Korean War, which ended in stalemate, and of the three subsequent illegal, unnecessary, colonial wars of, pre of presidential choice fought in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Now that this succession of costly defeats for US foreign policy has finally started to break the back of the American middle class, we might perhaps <clears throat> expect more mass-based resistance to the national security state, the very antithesis of a constitutional republic. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering uh, myself, you know, we hear this, this uh, information, what can we do? What can uh, Americans do? What can we do as uh, peaceniks uh, to begin to convince people uh, that the uh, military industrial complex is in the secrecy and the lies? What can we do to, to okay. bring that about? Well, first of all, we must not use the term, <laughs> I sound like a police, military industrial complex. Let's put that in the trash can. We're beyond that. We're far beyond that. And we've got to recognize where we are if we're going to act effectively. Uh, it's, it's, it's much more than what Eisenhower described. It's advanced through stages. And, uh, and it's gone beyond our republic. And so what we have to do is anything that weakens the power of the president uh, to wage war, um, but you know, I, 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 I confess, I, I put my mind to thinking about uh, the system. I don't, I, I know I don't do enough to think about how um, we might proceed. That's why I'm in Broome County Peace Action, to uh, work with people who are thinking all the time how to uh, deal with this issue. But we've got to describe the reality. Um, and so that's why I say, if you use the term military industrial complex, it, it's far beyond this, uh, far beyond that. Yeah. I thought I heard you say imperial America. That was the word. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, of course. We're talking about imperialism. We're talking about, um, you know, features of, you know, of American capitalist imperialism, but I, you know, if you understand the reality, you don't have to use terms that, uh, uh, you know, people might misunderstand because, you know, we have arrayed against us uh, corporate media, people who are, you know, hostile to, um, you know, an unvarnished you know, um, account of our behavior in the world. So we listen to Amy Goodman and we, we go on the web and we try to, on our own, we can do this today. And that's why whistleblowing is so important. Um, getting at the documents. Uh, was the, what was the first name of that young... Uh, Brandon... Brandon um, Manning. Manning. They're a real hero. Um, for what he did. Wonderful, wonderful. And, um, and we support conscientious objectives, and, 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 and we do everything we can to deserve yeah, I might even say that <clears throat> direct action is still out there as a possibility. Absolutely. Uh, Roy Bourgeois, who you, you all pretty much know, Ed Canan, who spoke uh, at Peace Action last uh, December, his wife, Ann Tiffany, was there as well. Right now, they may be in jail in Colombia, but yesterday, they blocked the entrance of one of the seven bases that the United States has now along the border of Venezuela. The United States is assisting Colombia, and uh, the possibility of action in Venezuela is, uh, is part of the imperial system that we have. So there are people out there, uh, they're really trying to bring attention, you know, somehow or another, bring attention to what's going on. 
because you won't get it from the Miami Herald or the New York Times or the Washington Post. George, George Hassler. Yeah, you, you asked the question, what, what, what can we do? Well, the one power we still have is the power of the vote. That's the one thing we still have. So we have to stop voting for people who are advocating war and start voting for people who advocate peace. Absolutely. And, and, even, and even though they may not win, at least you're building a peace voting block. And that's Absolutely. the one thing that, that uh, politicians in power realize is that they have to get the vote. So if we could develop a peace voting, back, vote, voting block, something that was visible, uh, when you vote for the lesser of two evils, your vote gets very good with everybody else, and there's no protest vote. So you have to separate your vote out so it can be counted. And we're fortunate that we have right here in the room someone who is willing to do that. S stand up, Cecile. Just stand up, Cecile. Cecile, Cecile candidate for the U.S. Senate. <laughs> Yeah. I, want to, I want to re mention, it was mentioned earlier in the program, but um, Judy Hamadich and the Creech 14, having trespassed at Creech Air Force Base uh, last year, are going on trial. Uh, I think she said September? Uh, in September. That kind of direct action where you trespass, get, get to a point where you can actually get close to where things are happening and refuse to leave. I think that's one of the most important things we do, and be creative about how we, about how we do that. And I want to say that I would like us all to support Judy and, and, and Kathy Kelly and the rest of them for, for their action. One more statement or, or question. Yes. Uh, I read a book two or three years ago called, I think it was called I Was an Economic Hitman, and you heard about it on Amy you know, on, on um, Democracy Now!, but it, it was completely missing from the mainstream media. And I'm wondering if you've read it and what you thought of it. It was incredible. Yes, I read I it. And, I read it and I thought it was um, uh, very revealing. Um, and, uh, and that goes on. But you know, um, there were economic hitmen. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you an example that um, impacted Imperial Japan when um, I think it was the <clears throat> one of the heads of JP Morgan was working with the uh, Japanese um, finance ministry officials to bring Japan onto the gold standard um, in the late 1920s um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and his behavior, he's a very well-known uh, financier, a, a daddy warbucks of that time, and uh, his actions uh, with, in tandem with the Japanese finance minister at that time proved to be disastrous for Japan as it embarked on its long war um, on the continent uh, in 1931. But there were economic hitmen operating in uh, the banks um, in, in New York, the big banks, and um, they would get into the developing countries, and in Asia, Japan was the fastest, um, and they would, uh, um, you know, do their thing. So yes, I, I, I thought it was a, a good book. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Herb. That's, that's been great. Right after this, if we can get uh, a fair number of people to stay around the bell, when we go upstairs very often, the ringing of the bell, which can be heard throughout Binghamton, uh, it really is important for us. It's around the time of the, uh, uh, the drop of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. If we can get a, a nice uh, showing of people up there, that would be good. Uh, we have some, uh, it's a good photo opportunity, and we'd like to have our Japanese friends uh, partake in ringing the bell.